Hi, I'm Sandy Simpson from Apologetics Coordination Team, and I wrote an article called Screwtape Legacy. Uh, the book by C.S. Lewis called Screwtape Letters was a clever idea in exposing a number of tactics of the enemy. Those principles are still at work today in many churches. Following is a list of some of the things the enemy wants to see in the churches and Christians in order to bring them down. Let's look at these. Backbiting and slander. This is a huge problem even for churches that are true to the word. Gossip quickly turns into backbiting and backbiting then inevitably ends in slander. Gossip is bad enough but slander is a very hard issue to combat. The person being slandered often does not know exactly what has been said about them and so does not know how to answer the invis uh, invisible charges. But those charges nevertheless get tried in public court and the person's reputation is hurt, even in the, in the eyes of those who do not know them. This is why the Bible warns about gossip and slander, 2 Corinthians 12:20. For I am afraid that perhaps when I come I may find you to be not what I wish and may be uh, found in you to be not what you wish, that perhaps there will be a strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, and disturbances. Second Timothy 3.3 3 says that people who are off base are unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good. Proverbs 20.19 says, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. Proverbs 16.28 says, A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And finally, Colossians 3.8 says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Churches need to nip slander in the bud. That means they need to ferret out who is passing around slander and tell them to stop. We are to put away slander, put it aside. Slander often turns into malice even when slander is not based on real facts, which often is the case. Also, uh, they, uh, the enemy wants to uh, foster a false sense of superior anointing. The idea of a hierarchy, hierarchy of anointing is being promulgated by many new apostolic and word of faith churches. But the fact is there is only one anointing. It is only, and it's only available through this, uh, and it's uh, only available through the second birth, not a second blessing. Upon the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he then gives gifts and empowerment to do the will of the Father through the person's life as they submit. If someone tells you that you may be a Christian, but, uh, but you may not have the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and, they, and they can give the Holy Spirit to you, give them this answer. I'm a born-again Christian, therefore I'm already sealed, baptized by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is working within me, um, convicting, empowering, sanctifying, bestowing grace gifts, and producing fruit. The Holy Spirit of God is sovereign, and He cannot be transferred by human hands, which was a misconception of Simon the sorcerer. A few times in, the, in Acts, the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands, which was always done in submission to the will of God and in agreement with His purposes. The Holy Spirit in this age immediately indwells all who believe, which does not necessitate the laying on of hands. There's much talk about all kinds of anointings these days uh, by false teachers. That's because they don't understand what the anointing is. There's only one anointing, and that is the anointing of the anointed one, Jesus Christ. God is the one who gives the anointing, 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22. Now it is God who makes uh, both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. There's only one anointing, uh, 1 John 2, 20. 
the anointing of the anointed one, Psalm 2.2 and Acts 4.2, who is Jesus Christ, King of Kings. When a person is born again, they are anointed by the Holy Spirit, foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. We share in Christ's anointing through the Holy Spirit when we believe that he is God and that he died and rose from the dead. Titus 4, 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, uh, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his, mer his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. No one can or should try to transfer the Holy Spirit to another person, as the anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit. This is what makes slain in the Spirit not only unbiblical, but dangerous. All right, also listening to and following false prophets and their prophecies. For some reason, teachers are being invited to many churches without proper vetting. I've seen many classic liberals who deny certain core doctrines invited to biblical churches. When that happens, leaven is introduced, which becomes quickly almost impossible to remove without complete repentance. The Bible is quite clear that we are not to associate with false teachers and false prophets. The church and individual Christians are commanded by the Lord to reject false teachers and heretics. That's uh, Titus 3.10, a man that is a heretic after the first and second ammunition reject. A heretic is defined by Peter as one who lays error alongside truth, secretly introducing destructive heresies. 2 Peter 2.1, but there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Christians are to reject those who preach a false gospel because they are condemned by the Lord. Galatians 1, 8 and 9, And even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Even Paul, a foundational apostle, encourages listeners to test his teaching against the written word of God. And he stated that those who teach must not go beyond what's written. Acts 17.11, now the Bereans were more of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And of course, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. Believers are, are to be discerning. Philippians 1, 9 through 11, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Proverbs 15:14 says the discerning heart seek, seeks knowledge but the mouth of the fool feeds on folly. Proverbs 17:24 a discerning man keeps wisdom in view but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. Proverbs 18:15 says the heart of the discerning requires acquires knowledge the ears of the wise seek it out. Proverbs 28:7 20, he who keeps the law is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. And finally, Proverbs 3.21, My son, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. So why do we test teaching against the scriptures? Because we're commanded to remain in sound doctrine, to keep the faith, to follow the teachings of the prophets, apostles, and Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4.3, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Titus 1.9, we must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And of course, Titus 2.1, we must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. False teachers are liars and do not remain in, in sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 1.10, for adulterers, perverts, slave traders, and liars, and perjurers, and for any, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Another way the enemy wants to get the churches off is exalting new revelation above the Bible. New revelation was the hallmark of the Gnostics and is also the hallmark of the new Gnostics. The Gnostics believed that they had greater and newer revelation over the written word and over the words of the apostles. They always claimed to have a new way of doing things and new concepts of God and doctrine. But they are liars and should be avoided. Even back in the first century, false teachers were coming around saying they were equal to the apostles. 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 14. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that you may be cut off, so I may cut off opportunity from those who desire uh, a, an opportunity to be regarded as we are in the matter of which we, they are boasting. For such men are false apostles deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We are commanded to stay away from new revelation that's not in line with what the written word teaches. Jeremiah 23:25. I've heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name. I had a dream. I had a dream. If teachers try to introduce ideas that do not hold to the basic doctrines of the church, they're not true believers. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. There are many doctrines, but there are five at the core of Christianity. The Trinity, God must be one what and three who's, with each who possessing all the de attributes of deity and personality. Number two, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man for all eternity. The second coming, Jesus Christ is coming bodily to earth to rule and judge. Salvation, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And finally, the scriptures, they are entirely inerrant and sufficient for all Christian life. Study what they teach carefully. They may state, state that they agree with those above doctrines. But what they teach and do, they will show that they are denying one or more of, of all those doctrines. The third wave teachers have proven over time that they do not hold to those doctrines by teaching heresy that undermines them. For instance, let's think about it. When they treat the spirit as a substance or an it, both deity and personality are denied, thus denying the triune nature of God. Or when they preach a gospel of repent and come to Jesus without mentioning the cross or resurrection, uh, salvation by grace through faith in Christ is denied. Be on the alert and study to show yourself approved, rightfully handling the word of God. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. The enemy wants people to elevate personal joy and finances above being satisfied with what God gives. This is the de disingenuous platform of both the positive thinking, positive confession crowd of Norm Vincent Peale, Robert Schuller, Joel Osteen, and others, as well as the Word of Faith Name It and Claim It followers of Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, etc. They've made getting rich as a king kid more important than the biblical precept of being thankful and happy with it, what God gives. 2 Corinthians 12.10 Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Philippians 4.11 Not that I speak from, from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. 1 Timothy 6.8 If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. And Hebrews 13.5 Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, uh, being content with what you have. 
For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever, ever forsake you. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Demanding that God give you stuff because you claim a relationship with him actually proves you are either a rebellious child or no child at all. Those who teach we should declare things to God uh, instead of having faith in him are actually teaching a type of blasphemy. The enemy wants people to be falling down under the power of slain in the spirit instead of getting up to preach the gospel. Those who fall down under the control of a spirit, quote unquote, are not under the control of God as he does not operate that way, but rather under the influence, even possession of another spirit. If a person is truly born again, they cannot be possessed by an evil spirit, though they can be tempted and impacted in other ways that do not cause a person to do things against their will. But those who fall and cannot get up or do things, or do things that are against their own will are clearly, in my opinion, in need of salvation. Slaying of the spirit is actually an occult practice in a number of cultures with shamans. It has direct correlation and effects that mirror the Hindu practice, for instance, of Shaktipat. God calls us to get up and preach the gospel. The conversion of Saul is our guide in this. Acts 26.16 But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you as a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you. The devil wants Christians uh, on, on their backsides. Uh, God wants us on our feet so we can effectively witness to people, not put them on their backs. The enemy wants us to substitute the gospel for pragmatic methods. Jesus demonstrated repeatedly a lack of pragmatism in healing, raising the dead, and many other things. That's because the gospel is not a magic trick. It's not a way to get certain results. It's a witness of the good news, which then follows the Holy Spirit to open a person's eyes to himself and their condition and realize the truth. It's then up to the person to believe that God became man to die in our place for our sins and, and resurrect to life. You cannot lay hands on a person and cause them to be saved. You cannot tell them, uh, you know, a prayer to pray or words to repeat that will bring them salvation. You cannot teach them certain rituals that will be salvific for them. You can only stand as a witness, preaching the gospel, which is our duty since the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15. And then he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Lest for we forget, we're also to follow that up by making them disciples in Christ, Matthew 28, uh, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The enemy wants us to use worldly methods to attract people into the churches. The day of seeker-friendly churches came to fruition with Robert Schuller, uh, Bill Hybels, uh, C. Peter Wagner, Rick Warren, and countless others. We are told in order to grow a church, you have to make that church into something that appeals to everyone, unbelievers included. We were to go out and survey the community and ask what they wanted in a church. Not surprisingly, when they uh, tallied the results, many of them included a number of worldly things, such as, you know, uh, cloning secular, secular music, providing coffee to be consumed during services, offering a number of social gospel services in the community, and promoting popular politically correct issues in the world. We were told by emergent church leadership men, uh, by men like Brian McLaren and Leonard Sweet that the church needed to become more postmodern in order to effectively reach a postmodern world. We were even to teach the Bible as if uh, the Bible is postmodern. Later, it turns out, the methodology of making churches more reflective of the world only worked to get people in, but not to promote the maturity of people who actually are saved by the gospel. 
The gospel and discernment were cast by the wayside in favor of the glitter of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Titus 2.12 says, Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Jude one nineteen says, These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. The enemy would like us to build bigger and bigger churches that become imp, you know, impersonal monuments to self. There are so many of these structures dotting the modern landscape, it's hard to miss them. How do the, these reflect the type of Christianity modeled by the first century early church? They do not. They're a monument to money, power, and self, and to the way, not to the way of humility and godliness. They are a monument to the efforts of men, not God. One review of a popular megachurch here in North Carolina sarcastically stated that if one wanted to worship money, they should attend the church. You know what? He was not far off. Instead of being humble like Paul, uh, who, you know, strived to be after, uh, who strived to be after finding out just how deceived he was on the road to Damascus, these churches uplift their head, head pastor as some kind of guru. 2 Corinthians 2, 1-5, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Faith that rests on anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ is a faith that majors on the wisdom of men and lacks the power of God for salvation. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. To anyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Uh, and uh, that's the Greek is Helen, which also covers the uh, Gentiles. The enemy would like us to be singing music that sounds good but ends up brainwashing people with false ideas. Modern worship music is generally ex extremely repetitive to the point where it puts people into a sort of diaprax trance. This technique is used either wittingly or unwittingly by almost all secular musicians and of course was then duplicated in the modern churches by modern music composers. They do this to allegedly make their songs more memorable as their secular counterparts attempt. But at the same time they are driven by the forces, other forces to brainwash people by the mnemonics of repetition. And that's one of the issues in testing music that I bring out in the articles that I have on my site on testing music in the church. Not only are many modern worship songs uh, repetitive, but frankly a lot of them leave much to be desired in the area of musicality, such as secular music does. They may sound impressive when performed at extremely loud volumes to large enthusiastic crowds, but if you have musical ability and step back for a moment objectively, you will often find a lot of it sounds the same, based on only a few chords, using very similar techniques. The church, again, in emulating the world with the goal of attracting the world, has fallen into the trap of worldly subpar music. The main issue of modern worship music is that lyrically most of it is not very useful in the teaching sound doctrinal concepts and can, can even be harmful uh, when often laced with heresy. Allowing books and uh, program materials by false teachers to be studied instead of the Bible. I first ran into this many uh, years ago in a church that used to support us. In fact, the church had been one of the churches my father pastored. But they told me they had been using Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, for two years in their Bible study meeting. I wondered how they could still call it a Bible study. Many churches now study books by modern false teachers. These books slip into the churches through women's groups and youth groups in particular. Many pastors even had sol even if solid biblically 
seem to think that allowing women in youth groups to sort of do their own thing is a good way to handle these issues instead of testing everything that comes into the churches because they are to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, an under-shepherd to God's flock. I see more and more women's groups studying materials by heretics like Joyce Meyer and, and Beth Moore simply because they, these false teachers pump out so much stuff specifically geared to the needs of small groups that they are readily snapped up by churchgoers who are too lazy to study and teach the Bible. Yet Bible study is the hallmark of a mature, effective church. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved in, unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The devil would also like churches to invite speakers to the church that have not been, been vetted and tested by the Bible. Often pastors will be invited to a conference somewhere. They hear an exciting speaker and come back to their churches eager to share that speaker with their people. But they rarely investigate the doctrinal background of that speaker and unwittingly can allow heresy entrance into their churches by promoting them and their materials. This is why it's so important for church leadership in particular, to be careful to test everything, hold on to the good. 2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Titus 1.9, Must full, hold firmly to the trustworthy message as has been taught, so he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Titus 2.1, we, we must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Romans sixteen seventeen. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, and have uh, and avoid them. Uh, Ephesians five eleven. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Second. Thessalonians 3 6 and now we command you brethren in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which you receive from us. 2 Timothy 3 5 and 7 concerning the, the the last days we say that some will have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What's the power? It's the power of the salvation message. From such turn away, for such people are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second John 10.11 says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker in his evil deeds. Second Corinthians 16.7, uh, 6.17 Therefore, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Jude one twelve. These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. And finally, 1 Corinthians 5.21, test everything. Hold on to the good. The enemy wants people sending youth to youth camps that are not teaching sound doctrine. Youth retreats are another place false teaching gets ladled into unsuspecting and undiscerning young people. They can then be exposed to the heresies of the emerging church as well as the third wave. They may even attempt to slay your child in the spirit. They will introduce them to contemplative prayer. They will teach them all kinds of unbiblical stuff and tell them stories that have not been substantiated. False teachers love to go after youth. They are an easy target. For prime examples of this cultic technique, watch my series on the Bethel Church of Reading, California, and their two Holy Ghost DVDs. What a horrible result to have your son or daughter come home with a whole new perspective on Christianity which is not in line with what the Bible teaches. Try taking them out of that stuff. Again, Romans 16, 17 applies. Mark them and ca that cause divisions and avoid them. The enemy would like 
churches to support mission work by agencies that are biblically compromised. I hate to say it, but many Bible translation groups and societies are compromised these days. Did you know that the name of Allah, for instance, has been claimed, has been placed into 90% of Arabic Bibles to placate Muslims? Did Allah create the heavens and the earth? If you answer yes, you've already been absorbed. They have stated that the first thing they do when confronted with translating a Bible into a language that has not been done yet is to ask around in the culture to find out what the name of their supreme being is and put that in the Bible in the place of the true name of God. <laughs> when did this start happening? So instead of using YHWH and other proper attributes of the name of the true God, they substitute the names of gods worshipped in cultures that the Bible states do not know God. Galatians 4.8, you did not know God. 1 Corinthians 1.21, the world through wisdom did not know God. 1 John 3.1, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Romans 1.28, he gave them over to a depraved mind. 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, the Gentiles do not know God. Uh, and Ephesians 2, uh, 12 through uh, 13, uh, they, the Gentiles are without hope and without God in the world. And 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are also many heretical mission agencies and even ones that, are, that were formerly bi biblical. The National Prayer Days of agenda is formulated and put together now by the New Apostolic Reformation out of the World Prayer Center. Many missions tied to specific denominations that have been changed into third wave promoters uh, should no longer be supported by true biblical Christians or churches. It's incumbent upon believers to test agencies they are supporting. The enemy would like the churches to allow people mired in sin to continue to serve in the church. One thing I've been, that's been happening in many smaller uh, biblically-based churches is that when they follow scriptural principles in rebuking and admonishing sin among their membership, some people reject the opportunity. Uh, the opportunity to print, repent of their sins. What do they do? They then leave that church and join a mega church where they can blend in and will never be asked again about their sinful activities. Oh no! Gays will join a church that accepts homosexuality. Fornicators will gravitate toward a church whose pastor has been involved in, an, in the church, yet, uh, you know, yet has not been rejected by the members. Those involved in money scams will usually end up in a word of faith, name it and claim it church. Those who want to do, do yoga and TM end up in a church promoting the teachings of the emerging church. There seems to be a church out there ready made for almost any sin. Where are the churches that will stand their ground even while losing some of their membership who want to continue in their evil ways? 1 Corinthians 5, uh, uh, 1 through 8. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're assembled, and I with you in the Spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, but with the leaven, uh, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We are to be unleavened. The enemy would like us praying with false teachers and other religions on National Prayer Day. As mentioned. Uh, above, National Prayer Day is a day when Christians from all different denominations are encouraged to pray together. Yet, they often do not realize and, and don't fully understand that they are praying with people from cults of Christianity, such as Catholics and other religions and Muslims, etc. How can Christians pray with people who are worshiping false gods? How can they pray in spirit and in truth with others uh, that are praying in another spirit and without the truth? 
My advice to true biblical Christians is to organize prayer meetings on their own in their own churches so they can be sure that they are praying according to the will of God and you know and to the true God. Acts 1:14 these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. So we are to get together to pray but not with false teachers. God does not look at how many people get together to pray. He looks for the righteous for righteousness, even if it's only representative of a few. James 5.16b says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The enemy wants us giving lip service to glorifying the Lord on Sunday while living like the Dickens that are for the rest of the week. Unfortunately, this seems to be an almost universal symptom in the er, a modern church. For many who call themselves followers of Christ, their Sunday life does not seem to follow them into their week, work week. Many seem to have a schizophrenic existence. It almost seems like they come to church to make themselves feel better or, or to impress their kids. Then during the week, they almost revert back to their unregenerate selves. This is what makes me question how these kinds of people can call themselves born again. When one is born again, they are to leave the old self behind and embrace the new man. Romans 6.6 6, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Uh, Ephesians 4.23-25 uh, And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each other, uh, to each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Colossians 3, 9 through 11 says, Do not lie to one another, since you have laid aside the old self and its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being uh, renewed to a new to a the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that you can even live like the Dickens in many churches today that sponsor alcohol, dancing, and allowing a tendencies to act out in any way, uh, you know, in any way thinkable after being slain in the spirit. It's unbelievable what's going on today in the churches. The enemy would like for us to have disdain for doctrine and testing false teachers. There are many prominent teachers, especially in the third wave and emergent church, who have expressed in messages and books their disdain for doctrine, as if teaching doctrine ruins churches. Kenneth Copeland said, I don't, believe, I don't preach doctrine, I preach faith. Uh, the heresy hunters that want to find a little more of illegal doctrine in some Christian's eye and pluck that little mote out of their eye when they got the whole forest in their own lives and their own eyes, I say, to hell with you. Oh, hallelujah. If you want to argue doctrine, if you want to straighten out somebody, somebody over there, if you want to criticize Ken Copeland for his preaching on faith or Dad Hagen, get out of my life. I don't even want to talk to you or hear, hear you. I don't want to see your ugly face. Get out of my face in Jesus' name. That was Paul Crouch, now deceased, head of TBN. The church has little idea how unorthodox it is at any given moment. If a church can't, can't yet be perfectly orthodox, it can, with the Holy Spirit's help and by the grace of God, be perpetually reformable. That's uh, Brian McLaren of the Emergent Church. The Christian experience is not primarily focused on our liturgy, doctrine, or ecclesiology, as important as that might be. We are formed by the dangerous stories of our great hero. And that's Michael Frost, another emergent church. But they forget that the true biblical teachers will always be teaching what's in line with Bible doctrines. Uh, t Titus 2, 1 through 3, But as for you, speak the things that are fitting for sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.6, we, we need to constantly nourished, be constantly nourished on the words of faith and of sound doctrine. 
2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. But Titus 1, 9 says that we need to be able to uh, exhort and instruct people in sound doctrine and speak things that are fitting for sound doctrine. Don't the people who put, a, who put down the teaching of doctrine to believers realize these two things? First of all, that they... Uh, that what they believe is also a doctrine <laughs> for them. And number two, they are the fulfillment of 2 Timothy 4.3. The enemy would like for us to teach people to judge not. This has been going on for years, particularly in the third wave counterfeit revivals. Um, you know, they, they, we've got people like Paul Crouch putting down uh, people say there are groups here in California that think they're the judgment seat of Christ. John Vere said, I'm so tired of criticalness. Uh, we've also got uh, uh, other people who have said, made fun of people who try to discern what's right and wrong. The judge not lest you be judged mantra is one of the three legged stool to suck people into the word, to, to the uh, third wave and word of faith and leave their discernment behind. The first is to judge not, applied to everything. The second is touch not the Lord's anointed, misapplied to false prophets. And the third is Gamaliel's argument that if a movement is of God, it can't be stopped, and we should leave it alone. The problem is that there are many movements that invoke the name of Jesus Christ that are cultic and heretical. Many false teachers in unbiblical churches use their statement of faith as a smokescreen to continue the debauchery of slain in the spirit and other occult practices. So true biblical Christians must discern, test, and judge. When an individual or movement claims to be Christian within the orthodox and within the orthodoxy of Christianity, the following verse applies. First Corinthians 5.12 What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? We are to judge. The issue of leaven from the Old Testament to the New Testament is consistent. We are to get rid of the leaven before it leavens the whole lump. 1 Corinthians 5.7 Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch. We need to make sure that we are testing everything, holding on to the good. There are ways in which we are not to judge, but there are also ways in which we are to judge. The enemy wants us to replace spiritual things with solical things, solical practices that appeal to the emotions. I believe that this is a major problem today in many churches spanning a number of denominations. People have been taught in society to, va to value emotional content over spiritual content. They're being taught that solical practices are actually spiritual in nature. But the carnal world is a far cry from the spiritual world. They mistake experiences like slain in the spirit for an encounter with the Holy Spirit when it's more uh, likely either a product of their vivid imagination or even demonic forces giving, uh, being given a foothold. But all these things that tickle the ears and arouse sensuality have nothing to do with the spiritual. In fact, they are used by the enemy to get people who claim to be followers of Christ to become followers of feelings. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. We need to determine if we're in the natural or in the spiritual. The enemy would like us to not defend the core doctrines. Not only do many Christians not defend the core doctrines, many of them don't even know what they are. Yet we are to use sound doctrine to argue for the truth. Titus 1.9 again, that we are able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. To sit under the teaching and influence of someone who distorts, twists, and even denies one or more of the core doctrines of the faith is not to... It is, is to not defend core doctrines. If you cannot stand up for the core doctrines of Christianity, which are what distinguishes us from unbelievers and false religion, then you can't call yourself a follower of Christ. The enemy would like to make unity for unity's sake more important than separating from those living in a lifestyle sin. Ecumenism and interfaith have invaded the churches under the guise of 
Christian unity. But the Bible is clear that true, true Christian unity is begun at the, sal, uh, at the salvation at salvation in the unity of spirit and brought to full fruition in the unity of the faith. What's the unity of the faith? It is the unity in what we believe in the core doctrines. Without that, that there is no unity. We are told to strive to keep both the unity of the spirit and the unity of the faith. Ephesians 4, 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit. And Ephesians 4.13 goes on to say, Until we all attain, attain to the unity of the faith, we are to preserve both things. So in conclusion, the enemy is scheming to corrupt as many people who call themselves Christians as possible. Don't fool yourself. The enemy is after you every day of your life. And the only uh, victory is initiated by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and holding on to that faith through all kinds of trials, whether great or small. We need to hold on to the good.